Today's case takes us to Setagaya, Tokyo. Setagaya is a serene suburban-style residential community. It is located not far from central Tokyo. It is made up of cultural amenities like art museums, libraries, and many parks. Setagaya is also renowned for having a large number of upscale residential areas. The city is popular with young people and filled with trendy coffee shops, adorable bookstores, and student pubs. The Miyazawa family was a joyful family of four who resided in Setagaya. They were a quiet, typical suburban family. In December of 2000, the Miyazawa family had planned to spend New Year's Eve at home, enjoying a quiet evening cooking a special meal and anticipating the coming year. Mikio, the father and the head of the family, was a 44-year-old businessman who worked in corporate identity development for Interbrand, a London-based international media and marketing company with branches in 19 cities around the world. Since it was a remote job, Mikio worked from home and had a private study on the ground floor, which he used as his office. Yasuko, his wife, was 41 years old and was a popular teacher who enjoyed her job and was well respected by her students, their parents, and her co-workers. Mikio and Yasuko had two children named Nina and Rei. Nina was their eight years old daughter and Rei, their son, who had speech defect, was just six years old at the time of their murder. The Miyazawa family occupied a duplex, a sizable house that had been divided in two. The other half of the house at the time was being resided by Yasuko's mother, Ashaui Jino. The duplex was close to Soshigaya Park, which has walking paths, sports fields, a children's playground. After settling into their house in 1990, the Miyazawa family fell in love with the lifestyle it provided. However, a few years later, the government decided to turn the area into a park for recreation and purchased all the nearby homes to make room for the project. The government already bought around 200 homes, but the Miyazawa family was one of just three households that were still in the area in December 2000. At the time, the area looks deserted and according to reports. The Miyazawa family planned to move out the following year, in 2001. Even though there weren't many people living the area anymore, the skate park at Soshigaya Park next to their house grew increasingly busy. Even outside their home, Mikio had to reprimand some rowdy teenagers for disturbing them. Additionally, he confronted Bizoku biker gang members for being too loud. He was obviously very stressed due to the inrush of people. At the time of the murder, the older sister of Yasuko was in Japan with her husband, eager to spend the new year with her family even though she worked and resided in the UK. They stayed with their mother next door to Yasusko and her family throughout the visit. Around 10 a.m. on the 31st of December 2000, Yasuko's mother, Ashai, attempted to call the Miyazawa residence, but the call was unsuccessful. Despite the fact that they shared a door, they respected each other's privacy and never paid a surprise visit. Ashai made several calls in an attempt to get through to her daughter and her family but nobody would pick up. According to her, they very rarely ignored calls. She then made the decision to go around and check on them. She noticed their car in the driveway, but when she knocked, no one answered the door. She then attempted to enter the house, but the door was locked. She returned to her residence to get her own key before returning to let herself in. What she discovered was a gruesome scene. The entire family had been brutally murdered in a horrific way. Firstly, she discovered the body of her son-in-law, Mikio, on the floor. He appeared to have fallen down the stairs, based on the position of his body and the multiple stab wounds on his neck. The terrified grandmother hurried upstairs to find her daughter and grandchildren. At the top of the stairs, she discovered Yasuko and Niina dead, lying in their own pool of blood. Both had been repeatedly and savagely stabbed. Yasuko's mother ran to her grandson's room in the hopes of finding him alive. But he was also dead, strangled in his bed. It was truly a traumatizing scene to witness. Ashai was terrified and confused at the same time. She frantically dialed the police's number, pleading with them to arrive as soon as possible. 
The house was in a mess when the police arrived at the crime scene. There were numerous documents lying around, and it appeared that someone had slept on the couch in the living room. A chest of drawers with each drawer open and papers sticking out of them was located behind Mikio's body. Investigators discovered a missing drawer in the bathroom with all of its contents in the bathtub. They also found garbage and bloodied bandages in the bathtub, which was an odd collection of items to throw in a tub. Police discovered 150,000 yen in cash as well as foreign currency worth 5,000 yen in Mikio's study. The only thing missing was Mikio's old jacket. It's possible that the murderer fled the scene wearing Mikio's jacket because he left behind his bloody clothes. Nothing else was missing. So robbery could not have been the reason for the killings since nothing else was missing. Police discovered a screen that had been cut and taken out of a window in the second floor bathroom while searching through the entire duplex. The bathroom was located towards the back of the house and could be reached from the fence between the property and the park. In light of the fact that all other doors and windows were locked and closed, this appeared to be the most likely point of entry. Footprints on the wall below the window were visible from the outside as well. As you walk from the bathroom, the kids' bedroom was the first room on the right. According to the police, Ray was sleeping in the room on the bunk bed he shared with his sister when the killer entered and strangled the child to death. Most likely noticing movement upstairs, Mikio went to see if his son was all right. He was pushed down the stairs after being stabbed with a sashimi knife at the top of the stairs. The next victim was young Nina. The murderer discovered her in bed with her mother on the third floor, which could only be accessed by a drop ladder. He attacked her but stopped midway through the attack when he realized that the sashimi knife's tip had come off while he was attacking Mikio. Yasuko and Niina likely believed the attacker had left at this point. So they descended the ladder to the spot where Mikio was attacked. Yasuko did her best to save her daughter by going to get the first aid kit. However, the murderer was not finished. He returned with one of their kitchen knives and discovered them at the top of the stairs, where he killed both mother and daughter. Yasuko and Niina sustained the most brutal assaults out of the four murders. According to forensics, after they both were already dead, their attacker kept stabbing them repeatedly. Yasuko was said to have made a valiant effort to fight off the attacker, desperately trying to protect her daughter from him, as evident by the wounds on her body. However, the killer was unfazed and saw that the job was completed. The perpetrator cut his hand during the attack and bandaged it with supplies from the family's first aid kit. In order to stop the bleeding, he had also used sanitary pads he discovered in the restroom. After he was done with his heinous crime, the killer comfortably remained in the house, which had been a happy family home just hours earlier. He drank some barley tea and ate some melon and ice cream from their refrigerator. He slept on their couch, used their toilet without flushing, and unplugged their phone. He also attempted to use Mikio's credit card to purchase theater tickets at 1.18 a.m. after logging onto the family computer. However, he did not finish the transaction because he lacked all the necessary security details. He went on to set up browser bookmarks for the websites of the business Mikio worked for and the institution Yasuko worked for as well. The police discovered activity on the computer at 10 a.m. on the morning of December 31st. Though it wasn't clear if the killer stayed online all night or if he logged in again the following morning. Police believed they could not rule out the possibility that Ashai accidentally touched the computer when she entered the house at 10.55 a.m. Chances are, if it wasn't her, then the murderer had already left before she arrived. The murder weapon, the sashimi knife and the kitchen knife were both left on the kitchen table before the killer left. At the crime scene, there was a ton of forensic evidence. Nina's blood and the murderer's blood were found on the first aid kit. Additionally, the killer had failed to flush the toilet and left feces floating in it. He left his hip bag behind. It contained sand that could be traced to the United States. The detectives were able to follow the sand traces all the way to a particular spot. It landed them at the vicinity of Nevada's Edwards Air Force Base. Also, a roll of tape which skateboarders frequently use to fix their boards, was found in the hip bag. Lastly, 
the hip bag contained a folded ironed handkerchief with traces of French cologne that was popular among skaters then. There were numerous footprints all over the house, which offered intriguing hints. The perpetrator was wearing Slazenger shoes, but they were never sold in Japan in the exact size he was wearing. That size was in fact only available in South Korea. He had gloves, but he didn't use them because his prints were all over the place. Actually, forensic experts were able to extract a full set of fingerprints from material evidence discovered around the house. He also abandoned his blood-stained clothing. His clothes, however, were left at the scene neatly folded, in contrast to the way he left the drawers, documents, and ice cream cups. Unlike the soft water in Japan, the clothes had been washed in hard water with a higher mineral content. The water used was typical in Korea, though. The purchase of the sweater the killer wore and the knife he used was tracked by the police to the Kanagawa prefecture. Only 130 of the identical sweaters were ever sold, but only 12 of the owners could be located by police. So, if the sweater was bought in Japan but washed in Korea, could it be that the murderer resided in Japan but visited Korea before the killings? Maybe the sweater hadn't been washed in Japan since he bought it because it was made in Korea. The blood found at the scene of the crime was used to create a genetic profile, which revealed that the unidentified suspect was mixed race. The killer's father was East Asian, while his mother was of Southern European ancestry. DNA revealed a unique gene sequence that can only be found in people of Chinese, Korean, or Japanese ancestry. One in five men of Korean descent, one in 10 Chinese men, and one in 13 Japanese men fit this type of profile. Detectives believed the theory that the murderer was a foreigner. Accepting that such a monster was not from your country was simpler. Despite sending investigators to Korea to work with local law enforcement on the case, the Korean government was unable to assist in identifying the murderer. In recent years, the idea that the murderer was Korean has gained popularity. The likelihood that the murderer was Japanese was only 1 in 13. He might also have been a Korean Japanese of the first or second generation. The Korean expat community and the diplomatic community were among the areas of Japan where investigators searched for a person of mixed race. Perhaps the maternal European connection could have offered some information. However, neither the killer's DNA nor fingerprints could be found on anyone. Police questioned whether the murderer might have been a member of the military due to the source of the sand in the hip bag. Could he have been a second generation Korean Japanese or Chinese-American citizen given that US forces have been stationed in Japan since the end of World War II? Despite the abundance of evidence, police were unable to identify the murderer. In an effort to identify anyone who might have had a reason to kill the Miyazawa family, they went back to the investigative board and looked at their connections and relatives. However, the victims, loved ones and friends had no idea who would want to murder them. They were well liked by the locals and had no known enemies. At the nearby skate park, Mikio warned skaters for being too loud. And that was it. It undoubtedly wasn't a good enough excuse to brutally murder a man and his family. According to forensic evidence found in the killer's faces that were left in the toilet, he had consumed sesame seeds and string beans, a dish that is very popular in Japan and is typically made at home. This must have been consumed by the murderer prior to the killings because it was not consumed at the Miyazawa residence. Police took into account the possibility that the killer still resided with his mother. A timeline of the incidents leading up to the terrible night was created by the investigators. There were numerous reports of animals being killed and dismembered in the park next to the family's residence, just six months prior to the murders. In August 2000, locals discovered that a cat had been skinned. Police were able to identify the perpetrator of the animal abuse later on in the investigation. He worked as a bank clerk and his actions had nothing to do with the murders of the Miyazawa family. Few days before the murders, Yasuko had informed her father-in-law on December 25th that a strange car occasionally parked in front of their home. A car had no business being there because the park's entrance was on the other side of the fence. They also discovered a strange man wandering around the house two days later. 
Local residents claimed to have seen a strange man on December 29 wandering through the neighborhood shops. He was dressed in skater gear and was in his late 30s or early 40s. They noticed that he was wearing the same clothes that were discovered at the crime scene. This seemed strange, especially given the season. He did not appear to be dressed warmly enough. According to one of the shop owners, the man purchased a sashimi knife, which was the only knife sold that day. Strangely, the forensics identified the knife as the same knife the killer had used. A neighbor of the Miyazawa family saw the same man walking around their house again the following day. Everyone had left the house to go shopping, so nobody was home. The witness described the unknown person in detail, telling police that he was wearing a gray wool hat with a black stripe. He was wearing gloves, a long-sleeved t-shirt, a hip bag, a colorful scarf, a black Unico jacket, and white Slazenger shoes. After the killings, the majority of these items were discovered in the Miyazawa residence. On the evening of December 30th, Yasuko called her mother at 7 o'clock to let her know that they had just returned home. Her mother then asked if the children were interested in coming over to watch television. Nina, the older child, loved the idea, while Rii preferred to stay at home. Nina spent a few hours with her grandmother next door before leaving between 9 and 9.30 p.m. to go to bed. The family computer was used for the last known activity in the Miyazawa residence at 10.38 p.m. Mikio opened a work email that was password protected. He is the only person who is likely to have known the password to open the email. A neighbor overheard a fight inside the Miyazawa's house at 11 o'clock while he was taking a stroll in the park. It sounded more like a husband and wife arguing than like a physical altercation. A loud thud was heard in the other half of the building next door, around 11.30 p.m. by Asahi and Yasuko's sister. They were both watching television while still awake. Another witness observed a man leaving the house quickly around the same time. When Asahi arrived after 10 a.m. the following morning, she reported to the police that the light on the ground floor and in the entrance hallway was on. However, the light, according to a paperboy who delivered papers at the Miyazawa's doorstep on the morning of 31st, was not on. A taxi driver came forward after the murder and admitted to the police that he had picked up three middle-aged men close to the Miyazawa family home. According to him, the silence in the car was unsettling, almost too quiet. The driver said there was blood on the back seat when they exited and one of the men was hurt. Another tip came in again soon after. A young man visited a clinic on December 31st, about 70 miles north of the Miyazawa family home. His hand had been cut so deeply that his bone was exposed. Medical personnel were treating the wound. The man was described by staff as being very composed and not showing much concern for his injury. Given how serious the wound was, they thought his behavior was odd. The man was described as being in his 30s, wearing a black down jacket and jeans. He left the center without giving any information, not even a name or an address. Only later in the investigation was this tip determined to be significant. Police initially believed that the murderer had left the scene in the middle of the night, but after processing the crime scene and receiving the results of the blood tests, they came to the conclusion that he had actually left in the morning, just before Asahi arrived. Numerous months had passed by the time the data from the medical center was analyzed and police were still without any leads on the man. In 2018, Tokyo police made information about their suspect public in the hopes that someone would be able to assist in prosecuting him. The information determined that the perpetrator was a young man between the ages of 15 and 20 based on all the evidence discovered at the crime scene. He stands at 170 centimeters tall and they were able to determine that he is right-handed by looking at the victim's knife wounds. He might have been a drifter or an undocumented immigrant, which would account for why he was impossible to find. Police speculated that the murderer might have been the son of a diplomat, a soldier, or the son of a wealthy local family who may have been one of the skaters who fought with Mikio in the months before the killings because it was determined that he was younger than 30 to 40 years old. A quarter million police officers worked on the case in the months following the murders. In Japan, violent home invasions are extremely uncommon. 
so authorities were determined to apprehend the murderer. Police were never able to identify the murderer, despite all the available evidence. Forty officers are still working the case today, reviewing case files and repeating witness interviews. They frequently distribute flyers with details about the killer's attire and appearance at train stations close to the Miyazawa's residence in the hopes that someone will come forward with fresh information. Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department has offered a 20 million yen reward to anyone who can assist them in solving this 23-year-old mystery. Every year, police gather at the Miyazawa home to pay their respects to the family and make a commitment to never give up on the effort to find their killer. The house is now a family mausoleum for the Miyazawas, boarded up and vacant. The building was recently targeted for demolition by the local council, but the family refused to let that happen. This is such a sad case. It's disturbing how the police haven't still found the perpetrator, even with all the evidence at hand. Friends, what do you think about this case? Please share your ideas and theories about this case with me in the comments. I would love to hear them. This case started on a freezing Saturday night in December 1991 in Austin, Texas. Two 17-years-old girls named Eliza Thomas and Jennifer Harbison were co-workers at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt store at the North Cross Mall. It was almost 11 o'clock at night and their shift was about to end. A little bit after 10 o'clock, Jennifer's sister, 15-years-old Sarah Harbison and her friend, 13-years-old Amy Ayers, were hanging around the store. They were waiting for the girls' shift to end since the four of them were going to a slumber party together that night. To avoid being late to the party, Sarah and Amy entered the store to assist Eliza and Jennifer close up in time. However, when the clock struck 12 o'clock, Officer Troy Gay of the Austin Police Department was on patrol that evening when he saw smoke coming from the yogurt store. Firefighters quickly arrived on the scene after the officer called in. They soon discovered a horrifying scene while putting out the fire. In the store, the lifeless bodies of Jennifer, Sarah, Amy, and Eliza were strewn across the floor. It was obvious that they had been ruthlessly murdered. The teenagers were all bound and gagged in their own clothes while completely naked. Jennifer, Sarah, and Eliza were found in the rear of the back room, huddled into one corner, while Amy's body was recovered in the middle of the back room Sarah and Eliza were piled on top of one another and Jennifer was lying nearby. The girl's legs were wide open and one of them had an ice cream scoop tucked in between it. The killer or killers had gathered napkins and other combustible materials from about the shop, doused the victims with lighter fluid, and then set the place on fire before escaping, leaving their bodies almost completely burnt beyond recognition. Their autopsy results revealed that they had all been shot execution style in the back of the heads. Additionally, two or more of the girls had experienced sexual assault. Authorities also disclosed to the media that two firearms had been used in the killings, raising the possibility of at least two killers. Police investigators and the management of the yogurt shop determined that $540 or so was taken from the shop. It was unclear if the girls had been targeted particularly because someone knew they would be alone inside the store that night, or if the intended purpose had been a robbery and the culprit had then recognized a chance to take advantage of them. Lead detective John Jones and his partner, Mike Huckabay, launched an immediate investigation into the case. There were several problems with the investigation right away. First of all, the firefighters who responded to the crime scene did their jobs but ultimately washed away important forensic evidence in the process. Furthermore, the city of Austin had only one fingerprint unit at the beginning of the 1990s, which lacked forensic expertise. Additionally, there was only one homicide investigator working the shift the night of the murders due to the limited number of the city's homicide squad. Despite the police department's shortcomings, detectives Jones and Huckabay had quite a large number of suspects. The police station's phones were ringing non-stop as tips poured in. 
When faced with 342 suspects and scores of fake confessions, the investigators became overwhelmed. The investigators started by looking into possible local serial killers due to the graphic nature of the crime and the staging of the teenagers' bodies. This led them to Kenneth Allen McDuff. Kenneth Allen McDuff was a Texas serial killer who is thought to have committed at least 14 murders. On August 6, 1966, he was found guilty of killing three teenagers named Robert Brand, Mark Dunman, and Edna Louise Sullivan. These killings were known as the broomstick murders because Edna's neck was broken like a broomstick after she had been sexually abused numerous times. For his crimes, Kenneth Allen McDuff was given a death sentence, but in 1972, the US Supreme Court decided to end the death penalty in a 5-4 ruling, and his sentence was altered to life in prison with the chance of parole. He was granted parole in 1989 as a result of prison overpopulation. It is, however, believed that Kenneth Allen McDuff further committed numerous killings upon his parole, including the 1992 slaying of Melissa Ann Northrup, a 22-year-old Texan. After many years of eluding authorities, McDuff was ultimately apprehended and put on death row. On November 17, 1998, the day before he was put to death, he admitted to killing the four teenagers at the yogurt store. He was foolish if he believed that making this last-minute confession would save his life. That day, as planned, he was put to death. Detectives looked into McDuff's confession but disregarded him when fingerprints and hair taken from the yogurt store could not be used to identify him as the killer. About eight days after the brutal killing of the girls, investigators received a tip to look into a teenager named Maurice Pierce. Maurice Pierce was a 16-year-old boy who was spotted with a gun that night at the North Cross Mall where Sarah and Amy were hanging out before going to the yogurt store. The weapon was a handgun with a 22 caliber, the same caliber as one of the weapons used to kill the girls. However, nothing came out from the lead when Detectives Jones and Huckabay questioned Pierce, along with his three friends who accompanied him to the mall. Ballistics analysis of Maurice Pierce's gun revealed that it did not match the murder weapon. Additionally, just like with Macduff, none of the four suspects were identified by the fingerprints and hair samples taken from the crime site. The detectives eventually moved on from this. The case was given to new detectives after years went by without any arrests. Then, in 1999, Forrest Wellborn Michael Scott, Robert Springsteen, and Maurice Pierce the four earlier suspects now in their 20s were apprehended for the killings at the yogurt store. These were the same suspects who had been questioned eight days prior to the girls' deaths and had been let go due to a lack of evidence. Michael Scott, one of the suspects, admitted to the murders. He wasn't alone though. Robert Springsteen also admitted to killing the girls and raping one of them. The police were sure they had their killers after these confessions. According to the theory, the four boys had intended to rob the yogurt shop. Forrest Wellborn waited outside and kept watch as Michael Scott, Robert Springsteen and Maurice Pierce entered the store. The theft went horribly wrong though and all of the females were killed. The allegations against Wellborn were dropped after the authorities made two attempts to indict him for the killings but were unable to do so due to a lack of evidence connecting him to the crime. Charges against Maurice Pierce were also dropped due to a lack of evidence, which was extremely difficult for the police and the families of the victims to accept, because he was thought to be the mastermind behind the crime and the subsequent killings. Both Robert Springsteen and Michael Scott were found guilty of capital murder after separate trials for the yogurt store killings. The state of Texas had approved a new death penalty statute making it feasible for Robert Springsteen to receive the death penalty even after the Supreme Court decision in 1972, but Michael Scott received a 99-year jail sentence. However, shortly after their trials, grave questions were presented that showed Springsteen and Scott 
might not have been guilty. In the beginning, there was no tangible proof connecting any of them to the crime. Both men added that their confessions had been forced upon them, and there was some proof to support their assertions. One of the detectives working on the case was reassigned after it was claimed that he had forced confessions in an unrelated case. Additionally, a picture of another Austin police officer aiming a gun at Scott's head during questioning surfaced. Both convictions were overturned by the courts after they determined that they had violated Springsteen and Scott's Sixth Amendment right to confront their accuser. This came 15 years after the yogurt shop killings were perpetrated. During the trial, Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen's confessions were used against each other, but their attorneys were never permitted to cross-examine the accuser. It was determined that their constitutional rights had been violated as a result. Later, in 2008, DNA testing on the evidence gathered from the crime scene revealed that neither Scott nor Springsteen's DNA nor that of any other persons accused of the crime matched the results. According to then, Travis County District Attorney Rosemary Lehmberg, the yogurt store murder was committed by Scott and Springsteen, but the men would not be charged again until the unknown man linked to the DNA evidence at the crime scene was located. The majority of law enforcement officials continue to believe that the original four suspects were the culprits and that the DNA evidence implicating a fifth suspect was a fabrication. The fifth suspect argument, according to Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen's defense attorneys, is absurd and they emphasize that no one ever brought up a fifth suspect before the inconvenient DNA results came in. According to some attorneys, investigators, family members and armchair detectives who have studied this case, the killers of the teenagers may have been two unnamed customers who were at the yogurt store right before it closed. Although 52 customers who had come into the store on the day of the murders were reportedly questioned by the police, two individuals who witnesses said were present at closing time have never been located. Three customers left the store shortly before it closed and on their way out, they reportedly saw two males seated in a booth and they didn't appear to be planning to leave anytime soon. Perhaps the men ordered a soft drink. When Jennifer and her co-worker decided to close the store, at least one of the customers witnessed her lock the front door and post a closed sign to prevent any additional customers from coming in. After all the other customers had left, only the two men in the booth remained. Witnesses gave the following descriptions of the persons of interest. One is around 5 foot 6 inches tall and has lighter hair, maybe like a dirty blonde. He seemed in his late 20s through early 30s. The second man is noted as being larger. Both were dressed in larger jackets, one of which was green, an army fatigue kind of looking jacket. The other had a black jacket. Neither of these males has been named as of yet. In the end, it is debatable if robbery was really the true motivation in this instance. It is difficult to believe that these killings were just the outcome of a robbery gone wrong, given the meager sum of money seized and the high level of violence. The likelihood that the murder was committed with sexual motivation and that the murderers only grabbed the money as an afterthought is substantially higher. It's possible that one of the girls knew the murderers or it's possible that Sarah and Amy were followed from the mall to the yogurt store. Linking the DNA evidence discovered at the scene to the two male customers who were observed by witnesses lingering in the yogurt shop after closure could hold the key to solving this case. The 1991 murders at the yogurt business altered the city of Austin irrevocably. The murders were referred to by the then mayor as the crime where Austin lost its innocence. Residents of Austin began to doubt the safety of their community after the brutal and untimely deaths of four young girls who still had their entire lives ahead of them. The I Can't Believe It's Yogurt store was converted into a nail salon, but a plaque honoring Jennifer Harbison, Sarah Harbison, Amy Ayers, and Elijah Thomas still stands in the parking lot beneath a large oak tree, serving as a reminder to anybody passing by that the murder case is yet to be solved 
and that justice is yet to be served. What do you think about this case, friends? Who do you think killed the girls? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment.